Mac Power Users, Episode 730, Treat It as an Intern with Jeff Richardson. Hello and welcome back to Mac Power Users. My name is Stephen Hackett. I'm joined as always by my friend and yours, Mr. David Sparks. Hello, Mr. Hackett. How are you today? I am good. As we record this, we're just a couple of days away from picking up our Vision Pro headsets. So it feels like we're, yeah, you know, man. it's the last days before we were changed people. Yeah, well, it's like when you're a little kid and you got out of school, but it wasn't Christmas yet. Yes. But, you know, the presents were under the tree. You were looking at them, thinking maybe there's like a remote control airplane or something cool under there, but you don't know. And what's going to happen? It's that's exactly what it is. It feels like it's December nineteenth today. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and uh, and we're gonna do a show on it next week. Uh, yes, you know this show will drop after we have ours, but we didn't want to make it like this is what we did in one day kind of thing. We wanted to have a little more time. Um, but uh, that so that's coming, and uh, I'm looking forward to sharing that with everybody. Uh, a lot of the early reviews are out, um, and they're you know they kind of run the gamut. And, uh, but I, I feel like I need to get my, my arms around this thing. I need to use it. Yeah, absolutely. It's always exciting to see when Apple does something new. We're going to talk about that later today in the show, but I guess we should introduce, introduce our guest. Welcome back to the show. Uh, Jeff Richardson. Thanks, David. Nice to be back. Um, Hey, Steven, nice to talk to y'all. Hey, yeah. Welcome back. It's nice to have uh, somebody else from the Southern part of the United States on the show. There you go. I'm down here in New Orleans. Yeah. I mean, uh, Jeff is the proprietor of iPhone JD. I was on a guest on our show earlier, and you were a very popular guest, Jeff. A lot of people wrote in and say how much they enjoyed listening to you talk. And, and um, we had a thing, right, where there were two lawyers on the show, and I said, we can't bring another lawyer on the show, right? But <laughs> now, there, now there's no lawyers on the show. So uh, iPhone JD, we love you, and we're happy to have you back. Uh, you know, although I forgot, uh, Jeff, uh, before we get into it, Stephen, you've got a new video out. Yeah, yeah, I do. It's it's been a while since I've uh, done like an Apple history video, and uh, a listener was very kind to lend me a super rare power book from the early '90s. There's 500 of thing of these things ever made, so there's even fewer of them, of course. Now they go for like tens of thousands of dollars on eBay. I never thought I would see one, let alone have one like on my bench in my office. Uh, but I was able to do a video with it. And so that link is in the show notes, the JLPGA power book. You'll probably recognize it. Once you see it, you've probably seen pictures of this thing because it is, it's bananas. It's a totally just wacky machine, but I love it so much. And it was really cool to spend a couple of days with it. Very colorful. Yeah. I was around back then. I don't remember it at all. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I really enjoyed your video. And as I was telling you offline, Oh yeah. Apple can make colorful Macs. That's kind of fun, right? Yeah. I would totally take, something like this in the, in the modern era, but I don't think we're going to get it. Yeah. But uh, either way, uh, so Jeff, um, you, uh, I, I kind of glossed over it, but you started this website called iPhone JD when the iPhone first launched and it's a thing. I mean, so it's not just lawyers, but a lot of professionals follow you and your, your take on, you know, iPhone and getting work done as a lawyer. Yeah, there's so much to say about uh, using the iPhone for productivity, and it's just gotten so much better over the years. I mean, you think back to that first year in 2007 when we did not have third-party apps, but we also didn't have, you know, Outlook email, corporate email, and then, you know, over time, you know, support for corporate email and mobile device management and all the, the – and so many, you know, incredibly powerful apps for getting work done. Certainly, if you're an attorney who works with words – but, you know, any kind of professional where you're, you know, drafting documents and reviewing things and, and dealing with things and sharing things with people, it's just an incredibly useful tool. And so I love talking on iPhone JD about all the different things you can do with the iPhone and, of course, the related universe of the, the iPad and the Apple Watch and, and, all, and soon the Vision Pro of, you know, the Apple mobile devices to get, um, to get work done uh, because it's, there's just so much to say. There's always something new. Yeah, you know, it's kind of fun looking at the Vision Pro stuff coming out. Um, it reminds me of the early days of iPhone because there like are there there are trade offs now. Like when back when you started iPhone JD, the iPhone didn't have copy and paste. You know, it was like you know it's like this amazing device, but there were there were holes that needed to be filled, right? And I feel like that kind of with this new hardware from Apple, like yeah, we came up with something revolutionary, but we haven't got it all entirely figured out yet. And 
it's kind of fun to be on on a journey like that again. That's right. And uh, on uh, on more power users today, Jeff is uh, New Orleans. I, I, is that how you say New Orleans? How do you say it if you're? <laughs> There's so many different ways to say it. If you're singing certain songs, you might say New Orleans, New Orleans, New Orleans, you know the what Big it Easy, means? the Crescent City. It. Yeah. So, what is a proper way for someone who doesn't live there to say it without making people that live there cringe? What, I think most I people. I think most people say New Orleans. But frankly, right. you know, as long as you come here and enjoy yourself, that's that's all good. <laughs> yeah, and it's a Jeff from New Orleans, and he uh, uh, he is going to give us on more power users today something I've always wanted. He's going to give us a lecture called Mardi Gras 101 because as we record this, New Orleans is deep in the process of Mardi Gras, and uh, I think we need to talk about that a little bit. Maybe we'll find a tech angle. I don't know. Jeff is a pretty smart guy. I think he can do this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but if you're not familiar, more power users is the version of the show you can get. Go to relay.fm slash mpu. You get an ad free version, no commercials, and you get extra content. And if you if you're a, a more power user subscriber today, you're going to get the uh, Mardi Gras 101 lecture, which is I think I think what most people pay what like a thousand dollars for that, right? Yeah, <laughs> five bucks a month is a good deal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, Jeff, it has been it's been a little while since you've been on the show. Uh, a lot has changed in the world of Apple hardware, and I'd love to hear what you're using these days. Sure, sure. I've been using Apple hardware, um, you know, since the earliest days. My first one was a Mac Plus that I got in college. Um, but for many, many years, I had been using the um, the iMacs, you know, starting with the, the colorful ones in the late 1990s, all the way through the flat screen ones. And I really loved having a big screen iMac with that 27-inch screen. And so when the uh, when the, the transition from Intel to Apple Silicon happened, I kept waiting. <laughs> I kept waiting to see if Apple was going to finally come out with a big iMac. And of course, they did not. And so um, about a year ago in the spring of 2023, I decided it doesn't look like Apple's going to do this. So if I want to have a big screen, you know, if I want to have a replacement, I need to move to a Mac Mini with a big external screen, the, the studio monitor. And so I made that transition and I've just been, you know, completely pleased with it. The Mac mini is so nice. It's so unobtrusive, um, just sits there right next to the monitor and the monitors there. And for all intents and purposes, it really is so much similar to the, the, the big screen iMac life that I'd had for so long. So that's my home computer and it's been great and I absolutely love it. Um, and you know, like everybody else, once I made that transition to, for me, it was the M2 Pro was the first one of my, my, the silicon, the Apple silicon chips that I had. I just could not. <laughs> it was just such a life changing thing. When I used to take videos of my daughter's basketball games and would render those videos on my Intel iMac, I basically turned it on when I went to sleep at night, and I'd wake up in the morning and it was still chugging along and had not finished yet. And now it just renders videos in minutes, and it's it's just amazing. I, I love it yeah. so much. It felt like the Pixar Rindar farm, you know. You oh just, gosh, you just push the button and then come back a few hours and see what happened. Yeah, you know, we get every time this topic comes up, we get email from listeners um, who who are bemoaning the the loss of the iMac because people love the iMac. Um, but I, I guess it's just kind of Apple even said recently, you know, that's it, guys. We're making. You know this uh, this mid tier iMac, the one they're currently selling, it's an M3, and we're not making a big one anymore. And if you want the big screen, you got to buy a big screen and a, and a Mac Mini or a Mac Studio. And I guess we just got to accept that. But the, the positive would be if you want to get an M4 in a few years, right, or an M5, you don't have to replace your screen. And um, you know, I, I guess I'm I'm going to choose to look at the positive on this. I, I get it. I had an iMac too, but I, I honestly believe Apple isn't like BSing us when they say you're going to you can get that mid tier iMac, or you can get a you know a component system with mm-hmm. a with a screen and a computer. Yeah, I'll say one more thing before I move on to to my next device, which is on that Mac Mini. I made two decisions that sort of surprised me at the time. One, I had previously been using iMacs with 32 gigs of RAM. Um, And yet for this Mac mini, I actually went down to 16 gigs. And the main reason I did it was to save a little bit of money so that I could afford to do my other surprise, which was to get the four terabytes of SSD space. Um, And I've been so happy with the decision having, I I know that more RAM is always good, but I had read enough people saying that because of the the advancements of Apple Silicon that, um, and, and memory swapping and all those things that are way above my pay grade, 
that, you know, 16 gigabytes would be enough because I'm not doing major video editing. I mean, these videos of my daughter that I described before is, is the only real intensive thing. And whether they take five minutes or eight minutes to render doesn't matter to me. The point is that it's not five or eight hours. Um, and so 16 gigs was, was frankly enough memory for me and it's been fine. And spending some of that extra money on having a big four terabyte um, SSD so that I could keep my entire Apple Photos library and, and the videos there and everything on it, it has just been luxurious. I love, I love having that all on device and not some, you know, wacky external drive that's plugged in. Not that I don't also have those plugged in for backup purposes and stuff like that. But um, so that, that, that was a decision that I made at the time and I've been really happy with it. And I'm, I'm glad because I was nervous at the time of whether having a little less memory would be a problem and whether it'd be worth it to spend extra money on the, uh, on the space. But uh, I have not regretted either one of those decisions. Isn't it funny how that's been flipped, though? Because, I mean, in the old days, if you go back and listen to old episodes of Mac Power Users, we were always saying, spend every penny on RAM, you know, and you can always add more storage later. And now that's not the case anymore. I think it, the RAM is not as critical because it's, like you said, a lower spec of RAM can still be uh, workable, although I would never recommend 8 gigabytes to anybody. Mm. No. But 16 and up, like I did the same thing when I bought mine, there was a 64 and a 32 and I got 32. I got the lower RAM, but I sunk a, you know, a kidney's worth of money into my, uh, my SSD. Mm -hmm. Um, So, so it's all, um, it's just odd to me that that has flipped, but I think the, the old wisdom doesn't apply anymore. Well, as much as I love my Mac mini, that's not really the focus of my Apple life because that's my home computer. As an attorney, I work at a law firm that like every other large law firm in the country uses PCs. So, I mean, as I talk to you all right now, I'm in my office um, in a, you know, downtown New Orleans using a PC to talk to you. And so a, B, a PC is a big part of my life, but the, the, the main Apple portion of my life is those mobile technologies like the focus of, of iPhone JD, which is the iPhone and especially the iPad. I use a 12.9 inch iPad Pro the version that came out in uh, spring of 2021. And I mean, I use that, I, I, I just use it to get so much work done. It's not even funny. It is always right there, right next to my computer, my, my PC. And so I might be typing in Microsoft Word on my PC, but I'm looking at documents and everything else. My iPad, I love that huge screen. Um, you know, the rumors are that Apple is going to come out with new iPads soon. And except for the fact that I just spent all of my money on the Apple Vision Pro, <laughs> I would be interested, I'm sure, in whatever Apple may come out with in the next couple of months. Um, but this one has served me well. So um, so that's what I get a ton of my work done. And then I always use the um, the latest and greatest iPhone. I have the, the, this was the first year that I actually went up to the Max model and was really happy to, to go to that larger screen. Um, but, the, you know, so much of the work that I do actually gets gets done on my iPad or to a certain degree on my iPhone. Um, not that the computers don't play a role in my life. They do, but I just get so much done on the iPad and iPhone. Yeah. And, and that's such a, a complimenting device for you. Like, I think we have, again, listeners in your shoes where they go to work every day and there's a PC on their desk and they're required to be on that, but you can use an iPad in conjunction with that. And we're going to, we're going to get into that in this episode some of your app recommendations and workflows because they're very interesting. But uh, you you always stand out in my mind as an iPad power user because of the way you do that. And you, and you also do all your remote computing on iPad too, if memory Absolutely. serves. Yeah. So, so I want to get in that deeper. One thing about the hardware though. So right now we've got these rumors circulating that an OLED, there's two interesting rumors uh, that relate to you. First is an OLED iPad Pro. So that would be a much superior screen technology and an iPad Pro that may get a price bump. I mean, if the rumors are to be believed. And also, there's a rumor of a 12.9 or 13-inch iPad Air, which is probably not going to have the OLED screen, but, you know, be more reasonably priced. Any uh, any uh, desire for either of those devices in your head? You know, in an alternate universe... I would always prefer to have the biggest and best iPad screen because it's what I use for so much, you know, whether I'm doing work on the iPad, enjoying a movie in the iPad, anything else like that. But in the universe that we live in <laughs> with this Apple Vision Pro coming out that, I've gonna be, that I'm going to be picking up on Friday morning, um, you know, when it comes to entertainment, you know, based upon the initial reviews that I'm seeing, I, and we're going to talk about this more later, but I might be using the Apple Vision Pro if I just want to sit back on the couch and watch a big, you know, Disney Avengers movie or something like that. Yeah. And so having that that perfect 
iPad Pro screen. Um, you know, since so much of what I'm doing with it is just working with words, I'm not a graphics professional. I'm not drawing anything or anything like that. Um, I don't know. I mean, I love having a beautiful screen. And right now my iPad Pro, um, I, maybe, I guess my iPhone might be the, the best screen that I have, but the iPad Pro is a, a, a second runner up to it. And I love having those beautiful screens where with HDR, you get the deep colors and stuff like that. Um, but it's going to be, it's going to be, you know, because of just spending, you know, almost $4,000 on the Vision Pro, uh, when Apple inevitably will be coming out with something, it's amazing to me that 2023 was the first year in Apple history since since the iPad came out in 2010 that no yeah. new iPad was introduced. So clearly mm-hmm. they're coming out with something soon. The rumors say it'll be March. And um, it's going to be interesting to see if I try to scrap together the money to put it together. Because if I think it's if I think the improvements are going to help me to be more productive, then yeah, it'll be worth it. But I'm going to have to see Apple song and dance on what the new features are and decide whether they apply to me. Um, I, it, I'll be very, I, I don't know. I really don't know. I feel like that's a lot of people are in that spot because the iPad is good enough. Like they haven't made the software so complex. Like I think my iPad pro is a 2019 version. And like, I don't know why I would be compelled to buy a new one because it's doing everything I ask of it. And yeah. I don't use it as much as you, but I still use it quite a bit. And and uh, I don't know. It's just an interesting story in the background for me all, all across Apple platforms as they've got so good at hardware that a lot of customers, even loyal, enthusiastic customers, don't feel particularly compelled to buy new hardware. I think it's going to be the same way on the Mac, honestly, mm-hmm. in the coming years. Yeah, and it's really a testament to Apple that you can get a nice iPad and have it last for so long. So many of the attorneys that I work with here in my office have iPads that they've been using for for even longer than you, David, and they work perfectly fine for reading and annotating documents and doing the work that they do. Um, And frankly, although I get a new iPhone every year and I've been doing that since year one, lately, the main reason I find that I've been doing it every year is because of the camera improvements. And I love taking pictures so much. I used to be a big user of my uh, digital SLR camera and the iPhone has just replaced that because although in some ways it's not as good, it's just so much more convenient to, to have, you know, the the best camera is the one you have with you as you know, that old saying goes. And, um, you know, that was the, frankly, this past fall, the reason I decided for the first time to go to the max version of the 15 pro, even though I was really afraid that was going to be too big for me, um, yeah. was to get that, the, the extra zoom lens and talk about a decision. I have not regretted that that zoom lens is amazing. And the extra size, you know, it was like the transition to the 12.9 inch iPad for two weeks. It felt too big. And then the next thing I knew it, I would look at my wife's iPad and think I was looking at an iPad mini. And it's been the same for me with the, with the iPhone is, you know, after using it for a while, I very quickly got used to the larger size. It's not too big to put in my shirt pocket. And, um, and, and I've really appreciated the better camera, but if it wasn't for the iPhone having better cameras every single year, and if it wasn't for the fact that that's something that's really important to me, taking pictures and videos, then maybe I'd say the same thing about my iPhone that I say with the iPad that, you know, it's fine to to use it for a while. And for people for whom photography is not important, it is certainly fine to continue to use iPhones for years and years on end. I talked to a person inside Apple once who told me that the amount of resources, manpower, money, and effort that go into the iPhone camera is shocking, you know? Mm. And I think they know because that's what sells iPhones, Mm -hmm. those cameras. One question for you, Jeff. Uh, next year, Apple comes out with a new iPhones, and we have camera parity again. You get the exact same lenses and quality, whether you get the big one or the small one. What do you do? Yeah, I'm going to stick with the big one. And if you had asked me that question uh, a couple of months ago, I would have said, you know what? I've I've heard of people online getting the big one and then going back to the regular size, and I suspect that that's going to be me. But you know what? I bought this one for the improved photography but now that I've gotten used to having a larger screen for those times when I am using my iPhone to, whether it's just read email or look at documents or, I mean, just pick that one, for example, looking at documents is not something that anyone loves to do on an iPad, on an iPhone, because the screen is so small. But with this slightly bigger screen, it makes it all the more easier if I turn that thing horizontal to, to look at a document and, and, and make a quick edit and talk to a client when I'm out and about. And um, so I don't think I'm going to go back now. What about your watch? Are you using an Apple Watch? I love the Apple Watch. Uh, I have the Apple Watch Series 7 that came out in 2021. 
I fully expected that I was going to upgrade that recently. But, um, you know, the last few years, the updates that Apple has added to the Apple Watch haven't, you know, those incremental improvements and adding additional sensors and stuff like that just haven't seemed quite important enough to me. So I've continued to stick on with the Apple, uh, the Series 7. I will tell you, though, that my Series 7 is no longer has quite the battery life that it did when I first got it. And so whereas it used to be, I had no trouble at all going all day. Nowadays, I do find that, you know, maybe about an hour before I might be otherwise ready to go to bed. Sometimes that watch is giving me the, the, the warning that it's down to 10%. And so I, I'm going to be tempted with whatever the next Apple Watch is, especially if it's something significant for the Series 10 later this year um, to maybe upgrade it. But I love my watch for, for notifications. I, I Even though I keep most, you know, it's, my watch is very quiet. It doesn't make noise and it, it only taps me for a few things. But for those few things it taps me for, boy, they matter. And I love, I love using it for that, whether it be, you know, text messages from specific people in my life or emails from a select set of clients or colleagues that I work with that I know that I want to know about immediately. Um, I just love having it on my wrist. It's, I, I, it's just this little buddy that's with me all day long. And um, I, I really enjoy using the Apple Watch. It, it's, it's fun to have. It makes me more productive. Um, it's just great. And, and Jeff, uh, for the folks at home, is, uh, among other things, an appellate lawyer. So he goes and talks to fancy judges, and they put him to the question quite frequently. And I only did that a little bit in my career. Uh, I was more of a trial lawyer than an appellate lawyer. But when I did those ap- appeals, I always was nervous about time because you get a limited amount of time. And I always thought, like, the Apple Watch would be great for appellate lawyers where you could set it to, like, silently tap your wrist as you're running out of time. Do you do anything like that with it? or uh, Interesting thought, but no. <laughs> Every yeah. court that I that I practice in for appeals, they always have a very obvious clock right in front of you at the podium, so it's easy to see your time remaining. And yeah. I actually have gotten uh, in the practice of turning my Apple Watch completely off when I sure. do appellate oral arguments. And the reason for that is a couple of years ago, I was doing an appellate oral argument in Baton Rouge. I don't know if I've told you the story before. And um, as I was walking up to the podium and the three judges were saying, Mr. Richardson, you may begin your argument, my watch started to ring like a phone call. Now I say ring, <laughs> it was in silent mode. So all it did was tap me. And of course it turned out to be a spam call, but I was so upset that when I wanted to keep my focus on my argument and hearing professional before the judges and everything else, I, all I could feel was my watch tapping at me and boy, did it make me mad. So now anytime that it's time for me to argue before a court, that Apple watch gets turned off, but oh, that was annoying. You know, I there's a judge in the Central District of California Federal Court who has a sign outside the door that says, if your phone goes off during court proceedings, there's a $500 sanction payable immediately. And uh, I remember whenever I went into his courtroom, I would just turn my phone off. But the, the problem for me was I did trial work. And a lot of times text messages were very essential in terms yeah. of like my secretary saying, hey, the witness is running late or whatever. I just kind of needed to be connected. But boy, was I careful uh, with those, you know, those notifications and making sure all sound was off. In fact, that's one of the things I loved about the silent button on the iPhone is that, you know, you could see there's a physical button there, although it's not there anymore. But the, uh, yeah, that's, um, that's, I think that's something that people like you have to deal with. Like, I want these notifications. I want this stuff, but I don't want to get into trouble when I stand in front of a guy or a gal in a black robe. But not me anymore. I don't know anything about that. <laughs> yeah, you're 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 free of all that that business now. You just got to make sure your phone doesn't ring on a podcast, which is yeah. Maybe we yeah. should start finding for that. No, I was yeah, kidding. Five hundred dollars. Um, mean yeah. Uh, so Jeff, you, you you've you talked a lot about this stuff, and and you, being iPhone and iPad Pro heavy, especially during the workday, are there uh, any accessories that make that uh, easier to manage? Yeah, you want to have a keyboard um, for typing things for sure. Um, I know that a lot of people love the uh, the Apple, what's it called, the, uh, the the one that's all fold in one case, the, not the Magic Keyboard, the, oh, the, the one, the, the, the nice keyboard that's got the built-in trackpad. I'm just blanking out the name of it. And that's fantastic. But for me, it um, has been unnecessary because it makes the, um, I don't need my iPad to be that heavy all the time. Yeah, it is heavy. Um, and for me, 
I tend to have keyboards wherever I go. So at my office, for example, I have a Logitech keyboard that's got those buttons on it that I can just press different buttons to change what it's paired with. And so it's normally paired to my PC, but if I want it to work with my Mac, I just press one button and it works with my Mac. And right now the third button makes it work with my um, with my iPhone. Maybe I'll change that to work with the uh, Apple Vision Pro sometime soon. But, um, but I love having that. And then if I'm at home, I have one of the old original Magic Keyboards, the small ones, just a, a nice Apple external keyboard. Um, and I use it all the time. So for me, when I travel, for example, I never take a laptop with me in part because my only laptop is the, the, the PC and, um, you know, nothing very exciting about taking the PC with me. I'm going to take the iPad anyway, and I can get my work done with the iPad, but I do stick a, um, a keyboard in my briefcase to take with me, you know, whether I'm traveling for work or pleasure so that if I have to sit down and, you know, answer the emails or do some edits to a document or anything like that, having the external keyboard. Um, so although that's the one key thing for me, otherwise the other accessories that I, that I know and that I use for my iPad are the, you know, external batteries. And I used to have a, used to use, um, an external, uh, Bluetooth mouse and an Apple mouse, but, um, I, I find that it's just as easy to touch the screen. Frankly, I do love the cursor. Don't get me wrong, but Apple's done on the iPad with that little, that little circle cursor. And, and we're now seeing that also in the, in the Apple vision pro, I think it's incredible and amazing great advancements in cursor technology, but, um, but I don't use them that often. I usually just, the keyboard's usually all that I need. This episode of the Mac Power Users is brought to you by 1Password, where your security is their priority. Go to onepasswordcom slash MPU right now and get 20% off. 1Password is your internet security app. It's so much more than just a password manager. With 1Password, you can make save, store, and retrieve secure passwords unique to each website and service you use, protecting you. But there's a lot more to 1Password. There are just a ton of features in this application that are always looking to make it easier and protect you. There's exhaustive keyboard shortcuts. When you lock 1Password, all your secrets are cleared from your system memory. If you use Fastmail, 1Password integrates it by creating masked addresses when you sign up for new accounts. But the feature I want to focus on today is Watchtower. Watchtower alerts you to a weak password, and it notifies you with a button that takes you directly to the changed password page for that service. It even gives you a score so you get a general idea of how you're doing. This is really useful if you're sharing one password with people that aren't as tech savvy. It gives them a very easy way to see how they're doing with their internet security. And Watchtower doesn't just manage your passwords. It tells you when the services you're integrating with also have security breaches. And you get all of that when you sign up for a 1Password account, whether it's a personal account or for your family or for your workplace. And as always, 1Password is secure by design, private by default, and verified by experts. So you know you're working with a reliable, safe company. Look, we all need to find a way to protect ourselves on the internet. It's not easy these days. There's a lot of folks out there trying to get at your information. Get 1Password on your side. Go to onepasswordcom slash MPU. So go to onepasswordcom slash MPU today and protect yourself, your family, and your coworkers. Jeff, one thing that we uh, wanted to talk about was the rise of AI tools particularly in the world of document-based apps. There have been stories out there of how that's gone wrong for some people, uh, but it seems like every time I have an update in the app store or I get an email about an app update, AI has been added. Some of the uses I think are more interesting or useful than others. Uh, I'd love to know where this is impacting your work. Yeah, I tell you, AI, I'm sure this is true across every industry, but certainly in the legal industry, I mean, it, It is really becoming groundbreaking, and it's amazing how quickly it's happened because it was just the beginning of last year, 2023, that people were starting to say, hey, this AI thing is going to be pretty cool, and ChatGPT came out. Um, And then in uh, faster than I can remember any other technology, it it is just, you know, so many products have come out, and some of them are really exciting, and some of them are really boring. Um, The you know, AI in the legal sphere has been important sort of in two ways. Originally, it was important because, you know, AI had this ability to just look at vast amounts of information and condense it for you in ways that became useful. Um, you know, I remember when I was a little kid, you know, in the 1980s, long before the internet, I used to have a, a set of uh, encyclopedias in my house. It was the uh, 
my parents got for us the the new book not the new book of knowledge it was like 20 volumes and i remember thinking gosh if i could just like learn everything in this set of 20 volumes and with all the annual updates like i, I would i could rule the world i would know everything and with ai it's amazing that with like chat gpt i mean it can in theory just have all the knowledge and then give you whatever you need and that that's incredible um and that type of you know big data form of ai is 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 going to become incredibly important for legal professionals and other folks that work with knowledge. Um, you know, a, a one example is that there's a program that most attorneys use to do legal research called Westlaw. Its competitor is called Lexis. And both of them, but I happen to use Westlaw right now, um, have these really incredible AI tools that when you're trying to do legal research and find, you know, cases with uh, similar fact patterns to the one that your client may have, you know, in the old days, you would have to do, at the old days, meaning months ago, you would do searches using search terms. And so to take a very silly example, if you had like a, a dog bite case, you might search for cases that have dog within a certain number of words as bite. But then of course, you may not find the case that doesn't use the word dog and instead talks about a poodle or something like that. And so, you know, specific word searches um, sometimes don't give you, you know, you, you might missing something that you really wanted to know about. But with these new AI tools that have just come out in the last couple of months, Westlaw now has the ability for you to ask a chat GPT like question and you wait a minute and it gives you these answers and it finds things that frankly, I don't know if I ever would have found um, or certainly would have taken me a very long time when it comes to, uh, to doing the traditional searches. So with that backdrop of how AI is becoming truly revolutionary for legal research, for, for knowledge research, um, what I've loved is that in just the last couple of months, we're starting to see some of that come to the iPad. And what we're seeing right now is not the search everything, although I know that that is coming. But what we're seeing right now is some specific examples of search a subset of information and give me the information that I need. And, you know, it sort of reminds me of, I remember, uh, you remember the movie The Matrix that came out? What was that the late 1990s when uh, Neo gets hooked up to a machine and and you see him, his eyes flutter and somebody's downloading something and then he wakes up and, and he turns to, to Morpheus and says... I know Kung Fu now. <laughs> it's this yeah. idea that you could just yeah. download Kung Fu into his brain. These apps are sort of doing the same thing because the two apps that I have been using for forever in my legal practice to work with documents, one of them called PDF Expert uh, by a company named Riedel, and another one called uh, Good Notes, which I use primarily for handwritten notes. But both of them have uh, sort of added a same type of feature, although they come at it in slightly different ways, that you could give it some information and then suddenly it knows everything about it. So to give you an example, in PDF, I was just using this one this morning. So in PDF Expert, you can take a document and right next to, at the very top of the screen, you have like a little uh, magnifying glass if you were going to do a traditional search, you know, looking for the word dog, but you won't find the word poodle. Um, you can now right next to it, there's a button that allows for an AI search. And when you press it, the first thing that it does is the app sort of learns that document, much like Neo learning Kung Fu within a second or two. And, and it knows everything about that document. And suddenly your app is like the little buddy that's with you who knows a document inside to out. I mean, imagine giving it, you know, for me as an attorney, I might give a document to my associate and say, here's the 50 page brief that my opponent filed. I want you to become the expert on that brief. And they're going to have to read it and reread it. And it's going to take them forever. But my iPad can now in a matter of seconds become the expert on that brief. And I can then ask the iPad specific questions about the brief. And so I can say, for example, you know, you know, what, is, what does this brief say about such and such? And again, I was literally doing this this morning for a brief that, I was, that I'm working with because I'm drafting a reply to it. And um, within seconds, the iPad gives me this answer in PDF Expert saying, and it's, it's this multi, it's like multi-sentence full paragraph answer of here's what this brief says about the topic. And again, I could have taken the time to search you know, flip through pages manually or, or, or try to do my, my tech, my term search, but instead it was just able to immediately tell me what the brief was about. Now, at this point, I need to pause and say that whenever you're dealing with AI, there's always the issue of potential hallucinations. And I'm sure most people listening to this have heard about how chat GPT can give you hallucinations and it can say five things that sound like it's full confidence and four of them are true. And one of them could not be more false. And there's no way for you as the consumer to know what's the false one or what's the true one without double checking it. And so it's the same true here that, you know, PDF expert will give me an answer. And every once in a while, the answer may not be 100% correct. But fortunately, that's not a problem because when it gives me the answer, it specifically tells me the pages of my document 
that it got the answer that, that it used to create this AI answer. And so when it says, you know, here's an answer to your question, and you know, you look on pages 22, 26, and 27, I can then turn to the specific pages and say, oh yeah, okay, now I see where it's coming from. And sure enough, that's exactly it. So it's it's finding information and saving me so much time just to jump specifically to where the information is. Or another example is that I was preparing for an oral argument a couple of weeks ago, and a big issue in my case was whether or not the trial court should have granted a trial continuance when some important information came out, you know, right before trial starting. And I was arguing that that information was so important that we should have gotten a continuance. And so I had read every possible opinion in Louisiana about when continuances are appropriate. And you, when you read so many different cases, you know, sometimes they might start to blend together. And so I would pull up one case that was from the Supreme Court from a couple years ago. And, and I just quickly asked the PDF expert AI, you know, what was the reason for a continuance in this case? And in a second, it says, oh, this one was because of such and such. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. That's one because of such and such. And again, I could have taken the time to skim through it and, and look for my highlighting and stuff like that. But it was just so nice to just, to just ask the question about the document and have it get an answer. I mean, this is revolutionary stuff that if you had told me, you know, months, let alone years ago, that I would be able to have these conversations with my iPad about documents and what's inside of them, I would have been like, get out of town. That's crazy stuff. And yet here we are. And it's, this is not, I mean, I'm using it. It's, it's, it's here. And uh, it's, it's just amazing. It's just amazing. Yeah. And you know, that is in my mind, the ideal user AI, at least at this stage, right? It's, it's your assistant, you know? Uh, I don't know who said it. I wish I had a credit for this, but someone said, treat it as an intern. Like, Someone yeah. who can do stuff like this for you. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to rely on it all the way to the end, right? And and there's the stories I think Stephen was referencing earlier is these lawyers who let AI write a brief for them and it gets the cases wrong and then they get right. in trouble with the bar. Yeah, you're not doing that. But what you're doing is you're letting your assistant do some of the donkey work for you so you can get to the important work uh, yourself. And uh, I think that is at least in the next couple of years, I think that is really the the blue sky for people that want to explore AI. Yeah, it really, really is cool. So I've been mentioning PDF Expert, but I don't want to give short shrift to GoodNotes, uh, which is just a fantastic handwriting app. It came out with a very similar feature right around the same time. I primarily use GoodNotes as the app for taking handwritten notes. Um, so like I just have a, a it's not, not literally a blank of paper, uh, a blank sheet of paper. It looks like a, it looks like legal paper, you know, yellow paper with yeah. with the blue lines on it. And I use it to take notes for all of my different cases that I handle. And I love the fact, and I've been using this app for years and years and years and years. And I love that I may have a case that's that I've been working on for seven years, and and just a snap, I can go back and find my notes from you know when I talked to a witness six years ago, and it's all right there at my fingertips. So I mean, I I could spend an hour singing the praises of Good Notes of how I like the app. But it now has this AI feature that's very similar so that I can take, for example, let's say that, you know, for me, I have a single notebook for an entire case. Uh, but let's say that between pages, you know, nine and 14 of my notebook, I took notes when I took in, when I interviewed a particular witness. You can ask the app, well, first of all, you can ask that questions about the document, just like I described for PDF Expert. But you can also, um, and PDF Expert has this too, you can ask it to summarize. So I can say, take these five or six pages of my handwritten notes. And just give me a summary and it's going to come up with bullet points and it'll say, you know, here's the five bullet points that summarize what this witness had to say. And it's not perfect. You know, maybe if I was doing it myself, I would have added a six bullet point, but you know, if I was doing it myself, it would have taken me 30 minutes and this iPad takes three seconds. So, you know, it's gets me far enough away there to just get a sense of what was important about what that witness said. Um, and in this quick little summary, um, an additional good notes, Although I primarily use it for handwritten documents, it can import any PDF document. And so one thing that I've actually done is I might take the same PDF document and import it into both PDF Expert and GoodNotes and ask the same question of both and just compare the answers. And they're going to be a little different. Frankly, with AI, you know, you can ask the same question to the same engine and you sometimes get a different answer the second, the third, and the fourth time you ask it. But it's nice to just sort of get a second opinion from the two different apps just because they go about doing it a different way. Um, as, as all of this stuff is in um, early stages, I should mention that there are some limits. With PDF Expert, you're limited to, first of all, you have to use the paid version of PDF Expert. And second of all, you're limited to 200 searches a month, which for me seems like, uh, you know, more than enough, but um, I might run up against that limit. We'll see. 
Good Notes is even more generous because it limits you to 30 questions a day. And for me, 30 questions in any one day is more than enough. Um, and I love the idea that I can open up the app tomorrow and start that counter over at zero. So um, so this is just really cool stuff. I mean, it's, it's cool stuff. It's immediately useful today. And then as I start to think about, you know, this is the 1.0 version of this feature. Where is it going to be six months from now, a year from now? What I suspect yeah. is going to happen is to go back to where I started. My PDF expert, I suspect I'm going to say, okay, you have um, 120 documents on my iPad that all relate to the Smith case. I want you to give me certain information about the case that you can just pull from all of those documents. And I'm sure that that sort of stuff is coming in the future. Even just to jump all your research in and say, yeah. You know, uh, tell me which cases involve dog bites that, you know, was by a family member or something. You know, you could you could have it like combine information from multiple documents. I feel like that's another next step. Yeah, I, I want to mention it. And I feel I missed I didn't miss that. I didn't mention this earlier when you're dealing with A.I., I'm particularly sensitive to this as an attorney because my clients, you know, trust me with confidential information, but health professionals have the same concerns. You always, always have to be worried about privacy. Um, and for example, sometimes if you use like chat GPT, for example, and you ask a question, um, you know, I have a case in which here's five things about it. You know, what can you tell me? Chat GPT itself might learn from your question and in answering someone else's question, you know, next week may actually use something that you've typed as part of the answer. And that's probably a very simplistic way as I described it, but you need to be concerned about privacy. And so I have asked both of the developers of these two apps, how privacy considerations work I did a post about this that um, hopefully we can link to in the show notes where I have, I put their answers in there about what they do. And the short version is they anonymize stuff and they, they promise that the, the, although the, the analysis is not being done on device, it is being done out in the cloud that the, uh, the company that's doing the analysis doesn't use the information provided, you know, as a basis for, for its own learning and all that sort of stuff. And so, you know, you should, uh, I thought that the answers were sufficient, but, but anyone concerned about privacy, which should be all of us should take a look at that. Um, but what I really hope is that we get to the point in the future, and, and Apple certainly seems to be going this way, where all of the AI analysis could be done on device, and that way you wouldn't even have to worry about it going out into the cloud somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm hoping that that's going to be coming in the future as Apple you know, tends to – Apple's clearly moving in that direction for its own use of AI, and my hope is that it can help developers do the same things with their own apps. Yeah, it seems seems like a, a no brainer. Uh, I, I want to look into the Good Notes workflow just a little bit though, because I think mm -hmm. this is something a lot of people are probably interested in. I know uh, I remember the days too where I used yellow pads and you'd write it down and then you'd put it in the outbox and you would hope it would find its way to the file. And <laughs> you know, you know, and there was all you know. It really was a, a data loss problem uh, when you used physical paper. But I think a lot of people are nervous about like using their iPad to take notes, like just the maybe a stigma attached to it, using it in meetings and, and maybe some, some of the friction as opposed to just a paper and pencil. How is that all working for you and any wisdom you can share? Yeah, it's always worked great for me. I mean, and so many people are used to sitting down with another person and having them open up their computer and start typing notes. And, you know, <laughs> this is something I've been this is an analogy I've been using for a long time, but you know, when a person across the table from you has a computer and all you see is the back of their laptop screen, you know, it's almost like they're playing that old game battleship. You don't know exactly what they have back there. Whereas with an iPad, what I like about it is you can just sort of lay flat or almost flat in the table, just a, a slight angle thanks to, to the cover that I use that, you know, forms a little triangle. And, you know, it's, it's not between you and the person you're talking to. You're, you're taking notes. They can see that you're taking notes. I, I have been doing this literally since 2010 and have never had a situation where using the iPad, um, in my mind, prevented any additional barriers to the free flow of information between people than just taking handwritten notes um, on, an, uh, you know, on paper. I will say that sometimes people are sensitive about whether you're recording them. And frankly, as an attorney, there are sometimes good reasons why you would not want to record somebody as you're talking to them because of discovery issues that, that can come up in the future. So I usually don't use recording features. I know that all of these apps like Good Notes and its competitors have features that you can record at the same time that you take handwritten notes. And it's really cool because if you are looking at your notes and you can't read what you wrote because you're, you know, just chicken scratch or something like that. You could then click a button and you can replay what it recorded at that time. That's a really cool feature, but it's one that for, uh, for legal reasons, I actually don't tend to use as a lawyer. 
But no, I, I, I've had no problems with it. And the flip side of it is I love the fact that I can find notes quickly and search through notes, whether they were taken yesterday or last year or six years ago, they are all just right there with me on my iPad. And if I want to export them into a PDF format and share them with somebody else, I can do that. And I can go back and I can erase things and I can move things around. When I'm, I mean, I've, I've talked extensively about how what I prepare for oral arguments, like the ones we were talking about before, David, you know, I will just handwrite my outline of what I'm going to tell the judges. And I do that because as I work on it, you know, I'm going to move this over here and this over here, and I want this to be in red. So it's big on obvious. And I want to put a star here so that my eyes know how important that is. And by the time I actually get to my oral argument, I'm usually not even looking at my notes because they're just sort of internalized in my head, but the act of handwriting it and moving things around and creating things and doing different colors makes it that the notes basically are, are in my head. And if I need to refer to them, I can sometimes on my iPad or sometimes I'll print them out. It just depends. Um, but that just works great. How much of that work for you is individual versus working with other people? Like if you are working on, let's go back to the example, you're looking through previous cases, you're using these tools, you're putting your notes together. Are they being shared out uh, and what format is that? Or is this basically just kind of in your world and it's it's just the way that you need it? Yeah, it's basically just my world. I mean, the exception is I will sometimes export my notes from a meeting and share it with one of my colleagues who's also in the meeting um, just so that they can also have them and maybe they can add something to them. Um, but I really haven't found great tools for collaboration, you know, the way that you might do for the, uh, you know, Google Docs or something like that, where everybody's adding to the document at the same time. But at the same time, I haven't really needed it either because my notes are my notes. Even even though, you know, some attorneys are, are solo attorneys or work in small law firms. I work in a huge law firm with 300 other attorneys, and I'm always collaborating on these big cases worth millions of dollars. And yet for me, have just, just having my own personal notes in my iPad, um, it's really it's it's been fine. Um, and again, except for exporting and, and sharing my notes, which I do a lot, so it's a great feature, but I it's never been an issue for me that someone else, for example, can't also be taking notes at the same time that I'm taking notes or something like that, sort of the thing that Apple might be allowing in its, in its Freeform app. Um, I've thought about that, and if there's ever a need for it, I know there are tools like Freeform that can allow for that, um, but it hasn't been something I've ever needed. The other question is, um, you know, the, are you familiar with the Remarkable and like things of its ilk. Yeah. Those are the, the, um, the things that are sort of, uh, the e ink. E ink. Yeah. In fact, yeah. I just saw one the other day, a review by a lawyer that says, here's the, the five best e ink tablets. And he decided that the remarkable was the best. And he had a paragraph in there where he said, you might ask why I'm not putting the iPad in here. And that's because the iPad's a whole different device. And I'm like, what are you talking about? No, it's <laughs> for me, the iPad is the best of all the devices. I know it has, can have distractions on it and stuff, but that beautiful full color screen with the Apple pencil, which is so good. Um, yeah, the battery life is not going to be as good as an ink device, but for me, I mean, again, I've never used a remarkable. And so maybe in certain contexts, it's great, but for me, there's been no context. Of, co- of course, I would want to use good notes on an iPad versus one of those, but has your experience been different, David? No, no, I have the exact same experience. In fact, I bought one because listeners told me I needed to do it and I sent it back because I, the iPad is so much better at this stuff. And and the argument for the remarkable, and I know we've got listeners who are big fans of it, and I'm going to hear about this. But you know, the, the argument is: look, it's a, it's a unitasker, you know, intentionally unitasker. You pick it up; it's, it ha- feels like a piece of paper. It doesn't have all the other apps to distract you. But honestly, focus modes. I I just don't have a problem using Good Notes to write notes down and not being distracted. So it's just not an issue for me, and I don't want another thing to carry around. But I was just curious if you had had any experience with that since you've been doing this so long. I read all those reviews because I'm fascinated and I, and I can't wait for someone to say, here's the real reason. But other than taking notes while I'm sitting by the pool with lots of bright sunlight or something like that, I really just do not think I need that stuff. Yeah. This episode of Mac Power Users is brought to you by Squarespace. Say that you've got a new business or a project or maybe an old business or project that needs an overhaul on the web. Well, you should start with Squarespace. It's the all-in-one platform for building your brand and growing your business online. You can stand out with a beautiful website, engage with your audience, and sell anything, product, services, and even content. Squarespace has everything you need all in one place. Let's talk about that store for a second. They have everything you need for physical or digital products. You can now set up and build courses in Squarespace as well. 
And your customers will get a bunch of flexible payment options. So you can accept credit cards, PayPal, and Apple Pay. But you can also offer customers the option to buy now and pay later with Afterpay and ClearPay. And you can work on site visitors becoming loyal customers with Squarespace's email campaign tools. You start with a template. You bring over your brand ingredients like colors and logo. It's all built in. And you can see how your emails are performing with the built-in analytics. I love building on top of Squarespace because all of these tools make it easy to make something that looks really awesome. Everything from tweaking typefaces and colors to adding images and video, it couldn't be easier with Squarespace. So start today at squarespace.com MPU. There's a free trial there waiting for you. And when you're ready to launch, Use the code MPU to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain name. That's squarespace.com slash MPU and the code MPU when you decide to sign up to get 10% off your first purchase. Our thanks to Squarespace for the support of the show and Relay FM. We talked about iPad a bit in the last segment, but you have some, some workflows and some things you're doing with the iPad and iPhone that we were talking about preparing today. And I thought it'd be fun to kind of go through those. And that's specifically kind of this new use for these mobile devices when you're at a Mac as, you know, as a status device and, and uh, the ways you can use the iPhone and the iPad for that. Yeah. I love doing this. You know, I, I have sort of like this um, I do literally have multiple monitors connected to my work computer. I've got the regular monitor and then right next to it, I've got a monitor turned on its side. Um, and it is helpful to have two different monitors, but I like even more. I like even more screens around me. And so one thing that was really revolutionary for me was back in, I guess it was the fall of 2021. Apple had originally come out with widgets on the iPhone. And then a year later, they came out with widgets on the iPad and widgets on the iPad were a game changer for me because Suddenly, instead of the front screen of my iPad being, you know, individual app icons, which, you know, whatever, now the front screen of my iPad is nothing more than widgets. And it, what it basically means is it turns my iPad into this dashboard. So as I'm sitting here typing on my computer, I can glance at my iPad and I can instantly see, you know, the time. Um, and I'm not just talking about the, the tiny little time in the top corner of the screen, but I use a, a Widget Smith to have like a nice big time right there in the center of the screen. So it's easy to read. And then I also have, you know, the weather and I've got like little notes and things from the notes app here, right in the middle of the screen. I use things for keeping track of my tasks. And so I, you know, right in the middle of my screen, I can see, gosh, it must be a dozen to do items that I have. And there's even more if I scroll down, but I can just glance at that and I can see the things that are on my list. And now that widgets can be interactive, I could even, you know, check off an item just by tapping on it. it and it uh, checks it off in the things app. And then I also have um, like a little picture on my screen that, you know, Apple has always done such a good job with that memories technology of surfacing just these incredible pictures that I have from years ago that I've long since forgotten about. And they just bring a smile to my face. Um, and so I, there's no reason for me to have any apps on my home screen. Of course, they're down at the bottom of the screen on the, um, the, the bar down there, but my screen itself is just widgets. And so I can turn, I can see information, assuming that my screen is turned on. I wish that the iPad could be have an always on screen. And so that's been really cool. And then more recently, Apple's done the same thing with the standby mode on the iPhone, which I totally love. If you've got an, uh, a 14 Pro or a 15 Pro that has that always on mode for the screen, I have right below my monitor, my iPhone, you know, if I'm using my iPhone and it's in my hand, great. But what about the other 23 hours a day that I'm not using the iPhone? Thanks to standby mode, it continues to be useful for me 24-7 because it's sitting there right below the screen. And sometimes I have it displaying the time as, as a lawyer, you know, I'm billing in, in 0.6 increments. So watching the clock is always important for me. Or sometimes I can have widgets with um, – just other useful information like my calendar or what's coming up, if that's important to me that day, or if I just want something, you know, delightful, maybe I'll just have it show photos. But the point is that my iPhone is showing me useful information all, you know, all day long, even if I'm not actively using the iPhone. And so this combination, I just love it. It's these, these multiple screens that are around me that are showing me information, which is both helps me for productivity, or sometimes it's just delightful. Um, and it's fantastic. And I'm so happy that Apple's come out with these technologies. It's really changed the way that I use devices when I'm not using them, if that makes sense. <laughs> you know, when I'm not actively using them, they're still being useful to me. 
Yeah, no, I, I love the idea of a status board iPad, you know, and we talked about it on the show. It's like, if you've got an iPad sitting around with the way Apple has done things, it can, if you've got it connected to a Mac, you can, it can be that status board for you with your tasks and the time and whatnot. And when you need it to be a second monitor, you can do that. As we're recording this show, my iPad is in, I always want to call it caboose mode. I don't know why, but it's like, <laughs> it's a train thing. What's, what's the term? Uh, um sidecar yeah anyway oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> caboose i don't know what my i guess i'm getting senile but the uh but the, i'll put my recording tools over there and i just turn my my ipad into a second screen for that one thing so i know that the recording is going okay and the levels are okay and all that stuff um but you know it really just like can be a real utility player next to your mac uh when you do stuff like that now now you were the way you were talking about it it sounds to me like you're not using the lock screen widgets. You're on the iPad. You're actually using the the standard on-screen widgets. Yeah, I don't really like the lock screen widgets on the iPad, David. Um, I don't know because they're they're not very colorful and they're not very useful. So I'm using the on-screen widgets, and you know my iPad screen stays. I guess I can control that in settings how long it stays on for. But the reality is I'm I'm using it enough and I'm back and forth enough that it tends to basically be on because I'm I'm you know typically using it, but it's not on all the time. And so what I would really prefer is if you could do the same thing on an iPad when it's plugged in that you can do sort of like on an iPhone and just have it stay on. Um, but the, the, for some reason, the lock screen widgets on the iPad, gosh, they just have never done it for me. But the on-screen widgets, that, that's really been the sweet spot for me. Well, I have good news for you. You can turn the, you can turn the auto shutoff feature off. Yeah, I know that I can. And I guess I could do that. True. And uh, so I do that. And then what I do is when I want, because when I'm working, I, I just want to be, I want, when I glance there, it doesn't work if you look down there and it's a black screen, right? So if, if you really want to get used to it as a list of your tasks and the time, you have to reliably know it's going to be there. So you turn off the auto shutdown routine and keep it plugged in, obviously. And, and, and that's the key, David. What I really want is, and, and you're probably smart enough that you can tell me I could do this with a shortcut. What I want is that setting to keep it always on, but only if it's plugged in. Because if it's not plugged in, I do not want to. I mean, the screen is the thing that kills the iPad battery. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I only want that when it's plugged in. And it literally is just now occurring to me that maybe there's a way to automate that. I'll have to look into that. I, I think there would be because the, the trigger would be plugging it in and then just change the status. And then uh, uh, let me look into that, Jeff. I'll, I'll share something with you if I figure it out. But, but to me, with the big iPad, it largely it remains on the desk. It, you know, I take it, I take it, I unplug it when I want to like read sheet music off it because it's a big screen. But but then usually when I finish my session of work, I'll just reach over and tap the button to turn it off. And so that's the way I do it. But but I agree with you wholeheartedly. If you're gonna use this thing at your desk to give you that kind of status board feel, you're gonna be much happier with the standard widgets that go on the iPad screen than uh, than the lock screen stuff. The lock screen stuff yeah. doesn't hold a candle to it. So what are the widgets that you use on, on that iPad? So I mentioned a couple of them. Widget Smith is great because it sort of fills in any gaps that you need. Um, I use the Carrot Weather apps. In fact, I have two of them up here um, because one just shows the temperatures and the other shows the radar. Um, Fantastic Cal, I've gone back and forth between the regular calendar widget and the Fantastic Cal widget. And I just think Fantastic Cal for me is the perfect combination of having the date really big on the, and they have a million widgets, but I like the one that has the date really big on the left because that's often important just to remind myself what date it is. And then on the right, I have my, my next upcoming events and my calendar events. Um, and, and I can see what's coming next after that. So that's sort of one side. And then I actually have two sort of small squares that are corresponding to notes in the Apple notes app that I use all the time. One of them is a, a list of my active files as an attorney. Every file has a file number associated with it. And I love that I can just tap that, that widget and it opens up the notes app to that specific list of all of my active files with the file numbers, because I, I just need those file numbers throughout the day. And it's a quick way to do it. And the other one is another one that just brings me directly to this note that I tend to use all the time. I mentioned the things app. Oh, you know, another cool one that I really like, I, I, I was singing the praises of PDF expert earlier but the one that's in my middle of my screen, and I should mention parenthetically, if anyone wants to see this, um, I, I, David, you're nice enough to have different people show off their home screens on your Max Parky website. And you had me do it about a year and a half ago. And I noticed that 
the screen that I put on your website is exactly the same as what I use today. So like that's been tried and true for me. So you can see a picture of it. In the very middle of my screen, just below the time, I have the PDF expert widget, which is cool because it shows the four documents that I looked at most recently. So I often am going to be, when I pick up my iPad to use it, I, you know, very frequently go back to the same document I've been working on all day. And so I can just, instead of just tapping the PDF expert icon and going to the app generically and who knows what document I'm going to see, I can tap specifically on the little, you know, the thing for that specific document and it opens up PDF expert to that document. I I know that saves me a half a second or so of time, but I just feel like I'm being more efficient when I do that. Um, The other one that I have on here is just the Apple News app, just so I have some sense of what's going on in the world around me. It does a pretty good job of just rotating in and out what are the top news stories of the day. So, and then I, and I mentioned pictures also. So with that, I mean, that, that's a ton of different information and I, I, I'm just better informed having all of that right next to me. It really is nice. And I, I'm, I sound like a broken record because this comes up on the show every once in a while and I tell everybody to do it, but there are so many people listening to this right now that have an iPad in a drawer, right? And maybe you use it a lot for other things or maybe you don't, but, but just like get a stand and stick it under your Mac screen and and try this. Cause I find it really useful. Yeah. I don't find that my iPad needs a stand cause I can just use the, uh, the, the smart cover case to sort of fold up in a triangle and have it yeah. sit there. But I was, I talked before about the standby mode in the iPhone. I, you can use standby mode without a stand, but you don't want to, I mean, you really, if you really want to take advantage of what I'm talking about, you really need to get a stand, a MagSafe stand for the iPhone. And fortunately there's, there's a ton of good ones that are out there. And, um, and it's great because when you put your iPhone there, not only does it hold it in place and provide it power so that it has that mode where it's showing you the always on information, if you have the, the iPhone 14 pro or iPhone 15 pro, but it also is constantly charging your iPhone, right? So whenever you pick your iPhone up, it's got a full charge, which is really nice. And some of these stands are cool that it can, it can charge multiple things at once. So the, the one that I use in my office is the anchor three in one cube with MagSafe. And it's great because although the main purpose of it is to hold my iPhone in landscape mode or standby, just behind the iPhone, there's a little Qi charging place. So I can sit my AirPods Pro there and they'll recharge, which is really nice. And then there's even this hidden little drawer to the right of it that if you you press it and it pops out and it has a little stand to charge the Apple Watch. And I was mentioning earlier in this podcast that as my Apple Watch is starting to show its age, Sometimes it runs out of power at the end of the day. If I'm sitting in my office and I just know that this is going to be a day that I'm going to really be taxing my Apple watch because, you know, I'm going to be, you know, working out the treadmill later on today, which uses a lot of power. And I I know it's going to be a late night. I will try to find that one 20 or 20 minutes during the day where I can just take my watch off my arm, stick it on there to charge it up during the day. And then of course I'm totally fine going until as late as I want at night. So I like having all of those things in, in a super, super, the key for me about this Anchor product is that it's super compact. And so everything fits right between the back of my keyboard and just below my monitor. Um, so it's like the perfect location. If you have more space on your desk, um, what I use at home for my bed stand is a device from 12 South called the High Rise. And it does everything that I just told you, but it's just a little bit more spacious. So if you've got the additional space, so that you can spread out more between where you charge your watch and your, and your iPhone and everything else. It's a really wonderful product. Both of these products cost about the same. They both cost, cost about 150 But for, for my desk, I just really needed something compact. The Anchor Cube is perfect. That Anchor Cube is a, is a very popular accessory. I feel like we talk to people all the time who, who use it. And there is such a rich... Um, a rich ecosystem out there. And when Standby was introduced a couple of years ago, you know, a bunch of us had horizontally charging phones and now suddenly they're vertically charging phones because this <laughs> feature is so useful. Yeah, it's really great. This episode of the Mac Power Users is brought to you by Ecamm, the powerful live streaming platform for your Mac. Try it today for free. Go to ecamm.com slash Mac Power Users. Ecamm Live is the leading video production and live streaming studio built for Mac. Ecamm does all aspects of video, not just live streaming. It's perfect for simplifying your workflow. It's easy enough to get started quickly, but powerful enough that you can create just about anything with video. You can do it all with the Ecamm app. Whether you're streaming, recording, podcasting, or presenting, everything's there in Ecamm, including support for multiple cameras and screen sharing. 
and a live camera switcher lets you direct the show in real time. I'm doing more of these live events with the Max Sparky Labs than ever, and I'm going to be using Ecamm for this stuff because it just gives me an easy way to do a multi-cam shoot. I can have guests in. We can put lower thirds in. It just makes everything easier. An Ecamm is a mature platform made by people who get the Mac. Whether you've been running professional productions your whole life or you're just getting started, Ecamm makes it easy for you to do that. So why don't you stand out from the crowd with high-quality video and logos and titles and lower thirds and graphics. You can share your screen, drop in video clips, bring on interview guests, and even use a green screen. This is all available to you with Ecamm Live. It does it all. Ecamm Live members are entrepreneurs, marketing professionals, podcasters, educators, musicians, church leaders, bloggers, and content creators of all kinds. Anybody who wants to look professional using video on the web should check out Ecamm Live. And you can get one month free today at ecamm.com slash MacPowerUsers using the code MacPowerUsers. That's a whole month free of Ecamm Live at ecamm.com slash MacPowerUsers with that code MacPowerUsers. Go there now and check it out. And our thanks to Ecamm for their support of the Mac Power users and all of Relay FM. So as I mentioned, we are on the verge of uh, Vision Pro, Vision OS, spatial computing being uh, brought into all of our lives. And uh, Jeff, I know you have been thinking a lot about this and, and writing some about it. And uh, I'd love to know how you're feeling about it. Yeah, you know, this is sort of the perfect transition. We were just talking about how I have all of these screens around me at my desk. I've got my my iPad to the left and my iPhone down and this screen here and this screen there. And starting in a few days from now, I'm going to have this Apple Vision Pro, which one of the hallmark features of it is the virtual version of exactly what I was just describing. You have a screen in front of you. You have a screen to the left. You have a screen above. You have a screen to the right. Um, you know, the reviews have just come out, as we were talking about earlier, of the, the folks in the media that got the early views of the um, Apple Vision Pro, and they were talking about how you can have up to, I think one reviewer said 12 screens. Not that there's a limit. You can have more than 12, but he's like, if you get more than 12, you know, you got to look all around you 360. It would be crazy. 12 is as much as he could possibly see at once. Um, I don't think I need 12 screens, <laughs> but I could see a world in which I'm sitting there working wherever I am, whether I'm at home sitting at just a table or if I'm, you know, traveling and I'm sitting at a hotel and, you know, without taking in multiple monitors with me, of course, just putting this device in my head. And suddenly I have really reproduced this environment that I just described to you with physical screens, but I'm doing it using the Vision Pro. All of those widgets that were on my iPad screen, whether there's one app or a couple apps can be over there to the left. And the things that my iPhone is showing me in standby mode, whether they be pictures or the time or calendar, that can be somewhere else. Right there in front of me can be my document screen where I'm working on Microsoft Word, you know, presumably using an external keyboard. But I have been unknowingly sort of living this life of having these multiple screens around me that the Vision Pro is, is looks like it could be perfectly made for. So that's going to be, um, that's going to be really interesting. And it's one of the reasons I'm excited about the Vision Pro you know, the initial reviews say that where their Vision Pro truly shines is on entertainment. And, you know, watching a Disney movie when you're sitting inside of a virtual Disney theater is supposed to be just incredible. And, of course, I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be amazing. Um, and I'm sure I'm going to enjoy that. But just from a productivity device, um, you know, I was mentioning before that when I travel, I don't take a laptop with me. I just took, I, mean, I have my iPhone, of course, all the time. But my iPad is really the device that I use to get work done. And that's something that I started to doing well over a decade ago, because what I told myself was, look, I'm going to take my iPad whenever I travel because I want to use it if I, you know, for entertainment purposes or just for reading email. And since I'm just taking that device anyway, can I also get it to replace my computer by being able to use Microsoft Word and have my documents on it? And for me, for the past almost 15 years now, it has worked great for that. Um, and I'm wondering if, you know, in the, the upcoming five, 10 years, Maybe the Vision Pro will do the same thing that, of course, it's big and bulky to carry around on like the iPad. And so that's going to be a knock on traveling with it. But assuming that I can make the space for it, being able to reproduce this environment where I have all of my screens around me, everything I need to get work done. Now, right now, there are serious caveats to this. I mean, just for example, the only reason that my iPhone and iPad can work with my work environment right now as someone that works for a larger company is mobile device management. And as of right now, I haven't seen any announcements 
on the Vision Pro even supporting mobile device management, which means that at least on day one, I don't think I'm going to be able to use my email on the Vision Pro, at least not my work email. I can use my, my other email accounts. But um, so there's there's huge questions to be uh, asked. Um, another one for me is going to be on my iPad, I will typically get work done just using the native iPad apps. But every once in a while, I will need like a special software application that only exists at my firm on Windows. And what I do is I'll just use remote access software. David, you mentioned this earlier. The one I'm using right now is called Log Me In, where my entire iPad screen will be replaced by my work computer, which I always keep turned on in my office. And so it's just as if I'm sitting at my work computer, even though I'm actually, you know, somewhere sitting in San Francisco in a hotel room. And so that's take over my screen. I have my iPad and, and I'm using my computer remotely and it works great. And it's not quite as fast. I'd rather use native apps. And so I tend to use that only when I need to use it. But it means that there's never a situation in which I'm like, oh, I wish I had a PC with me or I wish I had a Mac with me because the iPad can do all of that. And so I'm going to be curious to see um, will log me in or similar products. I mean, eventually I have to think absolutely they will, but I don't know if they're going to be there at day one. But wouldn't it be cool if through remote access type apps, I could have, you know, maybe in the, in theory, I could have like a, a Mac screen and one part of my virtual world and a, and a PC screen because of log me in and another part. And then my iPad and the native apps. Um, it's, it's all very exciting to think about. Um, we'll see how it will. I just can't wait to find out what happens, but I suspect it's not going to be available day one. I'm sure it's going to be throughout the course of the next year as, as the stuff gets built out much like for the original iPhone and the original, you know, everything else that Apple comes out with, it takes time for, you know, all the third party story to come together and stuff, mm-hmm. but I'm hopeful it's going to come. And I think the Vision Pro is is interesting from that perspective because it it is offering this mix of applications. You have iPad apps that run in compatibility mode. You have Vision OS apps that are native and even there there's different types and different experiences. But then you also have the feature where if you look at a Mac laptop, you can bring that whole interface, you know, basically like we're talking about with log me in where you have a floating window running your Mac OS environment and apps in there. And it, in a way it makes the Vision Pro a more flexible app platform than the iPad or iPhone. It, it kind of puts it on par with the Mac, right? The Mac, you can run native Mac apps, web apps, iPhone or iPad apps. Uh, you can even run Windows or, or, or Linux uh, titles if you need to uh, through various software. And, and that's just really interesting to me that we're we're on the verge of this new platform and it is in some ways very iPad OS-like. In fact, I believe it's actually based on iPad OS under the, under the hood, but it does have these these echoes of like a more desktop type environment. I think that's really interesting. Yeah. So that, that, that's a story that's, and I know that, you know, I'm going to have one in a few days and I'm going to try to start, you know, pushing it to the limits on day one and I'm going to come up against roadblocks, but that's okay. It's going to be fun being a part of this ride, you know, and we'll see where it goes. And who knows, maybe a year or two from now, we'll decide, you know, you can't really get work done because nobody wants to keep it on your face for more than a couple hours or, um, you know, there, there may be reasons that the iPad ends up being the perfect device for me, not the Vision Pro. But then again, maybe this will be the future. And, and you know, nobody knows until we, till, till we try it. And, um, and, you know, and I'm sure there's another thing is there's going to be different things for different people. I mean, I'm, I, I frequently talk to other attorneys that are amazed at the, some of the things that I do on my iPad just because their life is so different and they can't imagine not using a Windows computer to get their work done. And that's fine. You know, use whatever technology you want to use. That's that's great that we all have choices. But for me, I just have these workflows that that for me, that means that the iPad works great. And um, I'm sure there's going to be a subset of knowledge professionals, whether they be attorneys or, or people, other people in business that will find that the Vision Pro allows them to be truly portable and to have everything they need and to, to have these virtual monitors that are, you know, larger than anything that they could ever afford. Not that the Vision Pro itself is cheap, but um, it's it's going to be it's going to be really exciting. And, I, and I'm excited that like we're here we are, you know, we all get to be a part, you know, we remember when the original Mac came out 40 years ago, you know, we remember when the first iPhone came out and here we are at the beginning of another revolution. And I think this is going to be big. I don't think this is going to be a small one, like as much as I love my AirPods and my Apple watch. I mean, they're not changing the world. I think this is going to be more like the iPad or the original Mac. I think it has that potential. At least I hope so. Yeah. I mean, here we go again. 
And I, 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 I am very interested in the productivity story on this product. And I'm not sure version one is going to tell the whole story, you know, but, but I, I would like you, Jeff, I would actually like to get work done on the moon. You know, I would like to be able to, to use this stuff to contextually put myself somewhere and, and make progress. It's very, you know, the, the early reviews don't really cover that story. And, you know, people like you and me need to get our hands on them. And what I really want, David, I love the idea of being in a moon sounds pretty cool. And I know that you've been sort of pushing that to limits and, and other contexts in the past. But what I really want is something that's just the size of my regular glasses on my face that has all of this built in. But I realize that Apple, and I'm sure that's what Apple wants too. And they probably know that you can't, you can't start there. <laughs> you don't start on step 10. You got to start on step one and go to, and yeah. over time, this thing's going to get smaller and smaller. And eventually, instead of having a screen that reproduces the outside world, maybe it will actually become translucent. You'll actually literally see the outside. You know, I don't know how we're going to get from here to there, but I'm glad that Apple is starting because it means that it can iterate over time and things can get better. And it actually has a shipping product that has people using it. And people can say, this is what we want it for. And other people can say, we don't necessarily want it for this. And then it's going to move the platform further. You know, when, when Nilay Patel did his review at The Verge that came out, I guess, yesterday, you know, he says, you know, we at The Verge review products based upon what is shipping now not what's coming in the future. And that's totally fair because if you do a review, you want to review for the thing you're going to buy now. But I, on the other hand, am interested just as much as what this you know shows for the future. This is step one of other things that are coming and um, the possibilities are just incredible. Yeah. And here's the three of us sitting here on the verge of getting possession of them and being able to start. And I realize mm-hmm. the show ships the the day after or two days after we actually have them, but we are we're all three of us in this weird spot. Um, do you have any regrets about your pre-order? I mean, we're in d- during this weird period. <laughs> yeah, it's funny that you say that. I got because the price was so much. I got the two fifty six version, and I have been sort of regretting that a little bit because I do know that I like having five twelve on my iPad and I have five twelve on my iPhone. And um, just last night, I read a review by maybe it was. Uh, Scott Stein at CNET or somebody like that, that was saying that downloading the Avatar movie was like 27 gigs. And I'm like, oh, oh. <laughs> that's like 10% of the, of the 256. So yeah. I think when I, when I walk into that Apple store at 830 this Friday, um, if they give me the option to get the 512, I might do it because I suspect that this is, I mean, I'm not looking to replace this anytime soon. I'm sure I'm going to have this for, you know, two years or something like that. And um, it's always tough guessing how much space you need, but that's that's one thing that I'm going to change if I can. Um, another thing is I blame the two of you for, uh-oh, which uh-oh. is uh-oh. when I purchased my uh, Vision Pro, I decided not to spend the $500 in Apple Care because that's so much money. Oh my goodness, how could you spend that? But then I listened to your show about Apple about Apple Care was that one or two episodes ago, and I realized you know what. Sometimes Apple Care is nice, especially for an early device, especially for something expensive that can break. Um, and, and one of you, I think it was you, Stephen, was talking about how you can pay for some of these things monthly or annually as mm-hmm. opposed to all up front. And that's an option for the Vision Pro is to pay, I think it's $25 a month. Yeah. Um, and I, I presume that Apple will let me sign up for that on Friday. And I probably will because I just, without using it yet, I don't know, is this something that I'm likely to, to drop a lot um, and, and break it? Because the repair costs are going to be astronomical. They're, they're pretty high, even if you have Apple Care, but they're astronomical if you don't. And so that's something that I said no to when I purchased it. And the more I've thought about it, and again, thanks to the two of you, I, I'm going to probably change on that. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, yeah. work on it only, you know, on a couch and have pillows all around you and hope for the best. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Your wife's going to say, what is all these wrestling mats suddenly in the house for? <laughs> exactly. Uh, J- Jeff, do you have any thoughts on the sort of social aspect of this product? I mean, again, we're recording before we have them, but that's something we've talked about is it's a computer on your face. And if there's anything in the reviews about eyesight, uh, the the feature where you can see the person's eyes, uh, is that it's kind of creepy and doesn't work very well. And I think that's interesting that Apple clearly spent so much time on it and maybe missed it a little bit, but do you have do you have feelings on that? Like, is this something? Yeah, I'm going to be in my office by myself, so who cares? But not using it in public. Well, where do you fall on that? 
Yeah, I have been thinking about this a lot. Um, and I was just mentioning Neil Patel's review because he sort of concludes saying that if I can get, at least for the productivity portion of it, he says, I'd rather get work done where people are actually around me. You can look at my screen just like me as opposed to being, you know, so isolated. And and that's a fair opinion. And, and he's used the device. I haven't. But for me, lots of the time um, that I'm using my iPad, you know, I'm not necessarily engaged in the world around me. You know, I'm just getting some work done in my office. Sometimes my door is even closed. Um, sometimes it's open. Um, so I, I think for those purposes, it's going to be fine. And even for entertainment, I mean, I know that it's going to be obnoxious at first if I'm sitting there on the couch at home watching a TV show and my wife or my kids come by and I'm going to, you know, you're going to look so much more isolated as opposed to if I was just sitting there watching a show on a TV set. Um, and so that that's going to be a downside that, you know, there's going to be sort of an antisocial aspect to it. But again, so much of the time when I do things, it's just me working on things anyway. And so I hope that that's going to be okay. But it is something that, you know, you don't want to annoy the people around you. You know, people talk about the spousal acceptance factor and that, that's, that's always a, always a consideration. And I'm, I'm a little concerned about that. It doesn't sound like having the eyes painted on the outside with eyesight is going to make that much of a difference to those people around you. You know, I don't know. It may be the sort of thing that we put it, every time you put it on, your spouse rolls their eyes and says, oh, they're, they're tuning out of the world again. Here they go. But again, is that all that different from people, you know, sitting around staring at their iPhone screens and, and being completely absorbed in that? I don't know. Maybe I'm just trying to justify it. Yeah, I, I don't imagine I, I will be using it often when there are other people in the room. And I, I don't imagine that I would keep it on to have a conversation with somebody. But but I like Stephen said, I, I understand where Apple's going because these things are inherently, you know, isolation, you know, inducing and trying to find a way to make it less so is is a good goal. I'm not I'm not sure if they hit that mark or not. But yeah, it's early. I remember, David, that, you know, it wasn't that long ago that when you saw people walking down the street with those white, you know, cords coming out of their ears with an iPod, you thought, oh, look how antisocial that person is. And oh my goodness, those times have changed. There is nothing extraordinary about seeing some, you know, we don't have the cords now. Now it's all wireless with AirPods, but there's nothing extraordinary about seeing people around you wearing, you know, earbuds nowadays. So maybe things will be different in a couple of years than they are now. Yeah. But but that's kind of the thing they're aiming for, right? The glasses that that project the information that are not not a VR instrument, but a truly AR augmented reality glasses. And I feel like that's where they're aiming. But but like you, I think that's m- many many years away. This episode of MPU is brought to you by We Got Your Mac, your guide to Mac adoption at scale. Tune in for expert insights from SHI, Apple and around the business world. Do you remember those old commercials, Mac versus PC? I absolutely loved them. But that debate continues to rage today in the enterprise. In fact, some analysts speculate the Mac will be the dominant business endpoint by the year 2030. And that's where today's sponsor comes in. We Got Your Mac is a new podcast from SHI, and it's here to help business leaders navigate the fascinating, ever-changing world of the Mac in the workplace. From debunking security myths to attracting talent and overcoming adoption pains, you'll discover the ups and downs of delivering the Mac at scale. New episodes of We Got Your Mac stream every two weeks, featuring interviews with the experts at Apple, SHI, and from around the C-suite. So what are you waiting for? Make 2024 the year that your business puts an end to the Mac versus PC question. So go to WeGotYourMac.com or search for We Got Your Mac wherever you get your podcasts or click the link in the show notes. That's WeGotYourMac.com to start listening to new episodes and download free resources today. Our thanks to We Got Your Mac for their support of the show and Relay FM. Jeff, we always like to finish up these episodes talking about some of your favorite apps and services Lay some good ones on us, Jeff. What what are the apps that bring you joy and delight these days? Well, I've mentioned some great ones already. PDF Expert, Good Notes, ones like that. I'll throw out a few more that I enjoy using. One of them is an app called Parcel, which replaces an app that I had been using for years called Deliveries. Um, but Parcel is, is the latest and greatest, and it's really good. I, I tend to order so much stuff online. If I have to go to a store to buy something, I sort of feel like that's a failure. So, And so much of the stuff that I order tends to come from Amazon. I love the Parcel app that, you know, if I do have something coming, 
the parcel app will tell me what the status is, where it's located. I can just open up the app at any time and I can see what my different things are that are coming my way and what the status is. And if there's a problem, parcel is particularly nice because if you trust it with giving your Amazon password, and so far I haven't had a problem with that, it will automatically pull in your Amazon stuff. So if I open up my parcel app right now, I can see one or two things that I've ordered from Amazon um, that it just automatically put in there. And then I can also see, for example, that the uh, the Zeiss inserts for my uh, my Vision Pro glasses are currently in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. Gosh, they're getting pretty close to me now. They were in Anchorage last time I looked. And so um, it's nice just to have a single app that I can look for. Now, the, the things like a UPS delivery, I'd have to manually put in there, but it's super easy because you just copy the the tracking number. And when you open the app, you can paste it in there. And so that's one app that I um, that I use and I uh, I recommend to anyone that that orders lots of stuff. Mm-hmm. It's great. I will I will add to that. That's an excellent candidate for an iPad status board. Is your parcel widget? Oh, interesting idea. Definitely. I hadn't thought about that. That is a, yeah, that's a good idea. Another app that I've been using a lot lately is um, the Ivory app. Um, I used to be back in the day a really big Twitter user before the dark days came. And I used to love, I, I, I did not like the Twitter app, but I used to love um, the, the tweet, uh, TweetBot app, right? And used it almost every day. It was where I got so much information about technology and, and news and everything else. And then, you know, nowadays I, I basically never use Twitter for, since we don't need to get into here. Um, but I have found that for me, at least from the technology standpoint of getting like cool tech news and things that are shared by other people who are interested in technology, Mastodon has been really, really nice for that. And so I follow lots of, you know, interesting folks on Mastodon, like the two of you. And I, um, the Ivory app, which is made by the, the same folks at TapBots, um, it's just a beautiful app. It works really well. It's getting new features all the time. And I, I, I don't use it as much as I used to use um, TweetBot, but I, I do use it every day. And it's just a delight to open it up and have a nice interface and see what the new posts are. And sometimes I even post something myself, but I often, more often than not, just, you know, consume information or find out about, you know, interesting links and stuff like that. So that's another one that I like is Ivory. Are y'all, you know, y'all have, I haven't really used, I use threads a little bit, but haven't used it too much. Are y'all using any of those type of social media apps a lot? Yeah, I'm about half and half between Mastodon and threads and looking forward mm-hmm. to the day that threads federate Amen. so they can all just be one, wait. be one account. That would be, that'll be great. Um, yeah, Ivory's awesome. I mean, if if you were a Tweetbot person, it is Tweetbot, but for Mastodon, it's it's very similar. And and I, I mean that as a praise. Uh, Threads has their own app, but again, once they federate, so what, that means once they are, are interoperable with things like Mastodon, hopefully you'll, you'll be able to use Ivory for that as well. I mentioned two more apps that I recommend that are related uh, in a way you might not think of. Um, when it comes to games, I'm not really a huge person for like you know 3D shooters or something like that. I, I tend to involve, I tend to enjoy like puzzle games. That's more my speed. Um, and I have just become such a big user of the New York Times games app, you know, after occasionally doing crosswords here and there and, you know, doing Wordle when it first started way back when my wife and I decided, I guess about a year ago, you know, we were already subscribed to the New York Times just for news purposes, but we decided to add the subscription to games to it. And we both just love it so much. We, we share an account and so it means that, you know, I've always got as much as I've done other crosswords, um, there's nothing like the New York Times crossword. I, I, you know, give the credit to Will Schwartz and his team or whatever it is, but they're, they are just better crosswords than anything else you can find on the internet, I believe. And so I love doing the crossword every day or, or almost every day. And so the New York Times games app is what allows for that. I say almost every day because we have sort of this unwritten rule in my house that my wife and even my teenage daughter, like they get to do the easier ones on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then come like Thursday, Friday, I get to have the first snack at them, you know, through Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And that works fine because I I can play with them on the weekends. But it's fun that like I can start it and then close it. And then at home at night, my wife's like, oh, I added something to it. It it, it makes it sort of collaborative and um, and I love it. But it's not just the crossword. I mean, they have Wordle there, which of course was such a sensation and everybody knows about. Um, And they even have this uh, relatively new game called Connections, which I'm not very good at yet, but I really like. Um, and they have lots more in there that haven't appealed to me, but I know maybe one day will like spelling bee and others. And so it's just a great collection of, of games. And, um, and I really love that New York time games app. So I try to do the crosswords without, you know, using external resources, but sometimes on like a Saturday, you know, 
I'm just not finding the answer. And so sometimes you need to resort to Wikipedia to get a little help for that crossword. And one of the apps that I have loved using is an app by Casey List called Call Sheet, which is an app that has, it's, it's much like IMDB, but without all the obnoxious pop-ups and ads and everything else, it gives you information about just about any television show or movie so that when you have that crossword puzzle that's asking about, you know, the actor that played such and such in the 1978 movie, such and such, and there's no way in the world I'm going to know what that is, I can very quickly jump into the call sheet app and, you know, get that one answer. And then once I plug it into the crossword, you know, from that, oh, okay, so that's an S, so I can get this, and then I can yeah, get this. And unlocks everything get else, yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Well, those are some good apps. And Casey is uh, is a friend of the show. He's been on uh, on Mac Power User several times over the years. Good for Casey. Call Sheet is so good. It has been one of those apps that I never really looked things up when I was watching TV or movies because I hated IMDb with a passion. The UI is so bad, but Call Sheet makes it so much better. It runs on a, a different database, but it's it's so fast and so nice. I mean, we were watching something the other night, and it's like, who is this person, right? And otherwise, I would just like Google it. But I was like, no, I have Call Sheet. I can just look up the movie and find it within three seconds and not interrupt what we're doing. It is, uh, it's awesome. He's done such a good job with it. It's it's fantastic. I love it. Is he going to make a, a Vision Pro app? I feel like that would be a natural. Like I think he's talked about it. So yeah, yeah. Hopefully he does. That's the new question, right? Do they yeah. have a Vision Pro app? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jeff, it's always fun having you on the show. And gang, if you like listening to Jeff, he has a podcast uh, every Friday with Brett Burney, another MPU former guest, two of my favorite people in the legal profession. You know that. You know, lawyers have this reputation, but a lot of them are really nice people. And Jeff and Brett are two of those. You guys have the In the News podcast. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, I would love to get more more folks uh, to to join us. We've been doing the podcast now for, gosh, many years. And um, we're, you know, way over episode 100. I think we're in like the 130s now. And it's been great. Every Friday morning, Brett and I get together and talk about the Apple news of the past week. And although both Brett and I work in the legal technology field, and every once in a blue moon, if there's something special for lawyers, I will mention it. Um, most of the time, we're just talking about you know just the general Apple topics of interest, um, although sometimes from the standpoint of folks that are using those Apple products to get work done. Um, and so we just love it. And uh, if you are interested, obviously, if you're listening to MPU, you are very interested in the world of Apple technology. I'd love to have uh, folks check it out. Um, it will show up in your um, podcast player of choice every Friday afternoon or evening. So you can listen to it over the weekend while you're you know, cutting the grass or doing dishes or whatever else. And we just sort of uh, give a look back at some of the significant tech stories of the week and provide our analysis on what it might mean for the future. And we have a whole lot of fun doing it. And because Brett is just amazing, not only is it the audio podcast, but he also records it in video, puts in these title slides that are always, you know, full of <laughs> uh, maybe dad jokes, you call them very, very funny, you know, titles for different segments, puts it up on YouTube. Uh, I-, I can't even imagine the time he spends in making it look so good. Um, and so there is a YouTube version also for those of people who uh, enjoy watching videos as opposed to listening to a podcast. I myself prefer to just listen to audio podcasts, but that's just me. So you can listen to it either way, either on YouTube, um, in the news podcast, or, uh, or you can listen to the podcast. If you want to go to the website, it's in the news podcast.com. And we are the Mac power users. You can find us at relay.fm slash MPU. If you want to get that extended ad free version, more power users, you can do it at that website. We want to thank our sponsors this week. One password, Squarespace, Ecamm, and we got your Mac. And uh, for more power users, we're going to be we're talking about all about Mardi Gras. So stick around if you're a more power user subscriber. Otherwise, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>